So, um, my name's Anna. Um, I'm one of the uh, well new paediatric consultants at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow. Um, uh, but my background is that I have obviously been in training, like all of you, uh, for actually over 10 years now. And in that time, I've done quite a lot of cardiology, including a cardiology fellowship where um, I was your go to person that was getting faxed ECGs at Great Ormond Street. So all of you that faxed an ECG across to Great Ormond Street in the last week, a few years ago, that would have been me. Um, and I think that um, in that time, uh, I have realized that the or even before that time, actually realized that the the interpretation of ECGs in the general pediatric population is challenging or um, uh, has been forgotten, let's shall we say. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close the poll that I've, a lot of people have voted in, 15, 20 of you, um, and see what we've got as the words that you are using to describe a pediatric ECG, if I can. So what I've got is um, tricky. Oh, tricky. Is everyone hearing me? Tricky, daunting, challenging, uh, complex. Somebody's written that they get they provoke anxiety. Um, uh, sinus. Somebody's written challenging. Challenging's coming up again three times. Uh, mysterious, complicated, interesting, confusing, useful. I definitely agree with that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, complicated has come up two, three times, axis, a puzzle. So actually what's coming through here, the, the most frequently occurring words, which I'm not totally surprised by, are complicated, confusing um, and uh, challenging. Uh, and a few others in there that, that people are invoking anxiety, which is unfortunate, but not uh, this is not the first time I've heard this. This is the first time I've done it in this way with a QR code, but um, these sort of words come up a lot from general pediatricians. So um, on that note, what I am aiming to do for you all today in the next 54 minutes is for any doctors that are lacking in confidence in, in interpreting a pediatric ECG to have some sort of systematic approach to analyzing it and to trying to make a diagnosis, but with a particular focus on how um, cardiac symptomatology presents to emergency and in what situations we should be doing an ECG and furthermore, so for the people that have sort of got that basics, how I'd like to extrapolate on that is, what are you really looking for in these ECGs? How are you gonna filter out? So it's great if you see normal sinus rhythm and everyone's happy, we let out a cheer of joy, we fax it across to Great Ormond Street or wherever your local cardiac center is anyway, just to be sure, because that's what lots of people do. Um, but how are we gonna really pull out the one in a hundred or one in a thousand children that really need some extra help or need some extra input from cardiology? And how are we going to be able to talk sensibly about that on the phone? Where are we looking in these ECGs? And I hope that by the end of today, you will have a better feel for what that is uh, and where that is. At least have a start to have a good uh, conversation about it with your local departments. So I think that this is not going to work. That quiz is not going to work in the time that we've got uh, left now. Um, or the way I was going to do it will just take too long for people to um, to give their answers. So what I'm going to do is go straight to the systematic uh, approach to ECGs. Um, and I think that this is not rocket science and it's not something that someone won't have told you before, but I'm going to go it through, through it fairly systematically because this is how you get the most information out of them. First of all, we're going to look at the components of the ECG trace, um, how they're made up and what they represent. I'd like you to understand where the leads are and what the axis is and what that really means for a heart, particularly in paediatrics, and then have a systematic approach to all of those components um, and where they are going wrong, um, analysis of those components and what they mean, and then we can move on to, that will give you something to talk about. Yeah, that's If you can do all of those four points, you've got a conversation starter with um, cardiology, but then moving on from that will give you some examples of paediatric ECGs that have been done in emergency, and we can maybe try and have, if there's time, a little bit of chat, if people will switch their microphones off, chat about what people think about them um, and where they would go with it. So let's go for that. First of all, lead placement. You do not have to remember this at all. On most ECG machines, it shows you where to put the leads. And more than that, um, the majority of ECGs aren't actually done by the medics. They are done by the nurses. But it's important to know where they are, because if the leads start looking wrong, or if something doesn't look right in the ECG, one of the first questions is about equipment. Has it been used properly? Um, so if you look at here, V1, V2, these are the chest leads. They sometimes get called C. This is where they should be. 
there, there, and then around to V6. They are the most commonly occurring ones. These are used for other things that we are not going to go into today, but these are where the six chest lead goes, six chest leads go, and then you put one on the right shoulder or arm somewhere, the left shoulder, and then one on the feet somewhere, okay, and there's usually a, um, an earth lead as well. Uh, so that's where they should be. And the reason I show this diagram every time is because, um, oh, you can't see my cursor, sorry. So the, the reason I show this diagram is because uh, you, knowing where those V1 to V6 leads are, if you can visualize where they have been and you're then looking at the ECG, you're sort of visualizing what elect, where you're seeing that electrical activity in the heart and whether it's over um, the anterior part of the heart, whether it's further around towards the left ventricle, that's what this is essentially showing you. So it's quite a visual thing. Um, so my systematic approach to the ECG, as with everything, x-rays and everything, you check the patient and their details are correct. There should be either a sticker or uh, manually in inputted uh, details on the machine. Then always check the paper speed and voltage criteria um, and that they match to um, what is standard for ECGs, because if they do not, it will look very unusual. Um, and all of the calculations that you make will almost inevitably be wrong because you make them based on those two things being in a standardized uh, pattern which we'll come on to. Then look at the rate and the rhythm. Um, and then the axis. I always put this in here because axis is typically difficult for uh, people to understand and to do. And if you don't do it at this stage, you're probably going to get through the whole ECG and then not uh, actually interpret the axis at all. Um, then look at the indiv individual components and then calculate some intervals. So first of all, rate calculation. Um, the most common way of doing this is the very top one which is you look at the distance between two R spikes um, and uh, two of them, and then divide it by uh, 300. Okay, so um, it, divide the number of big boxes between the RR by three, uh, 300 divided by, sorry, 300 divided by the number of big boxes between two RR spikes. We'll see a proper ECG, which will make that easier to put into context. But the reason I talked to you very far, at the very first slide about uh, paper speed, is because this all relies on the paper going through the machine at a consistent speed, which is that. It has to go through at that speed for that calculation to be correct. So the rate calculation needs um, the, so you need to check the paper speed first. Okay, next, normal sinus rhythm. This is something that um, everyone wants an ECG to be in, um, but how do we know? And um, I think I ask this question a lot and in more face to face or more interactive teaching with um, fewer uh, people uh, where, you, where you can encourage a lot more interaction. I often get people to go through the criteria um, and typically I'll get three. Um, there are actually five criteria for being in normal sinus rhythm and I'm going to go through them, but I'm going to explain how they link to the phrase normal sinus rhythm because I think that makes it easier to remember. Um, so first of all, this is the most obvious one, I suppose. Um, and this is the one that most people come up with, is that each QRS, so that each ventricular depolarization, so ventricular beat, is preceded by a P wave. So that means a P wave has been created to, to then be transmitted and create the ventricular depolarization. Okay, so that's a rhythm. It is meaning that the heart, heart is connected. So the atria where this beat is being correct, can, um, created as being connected to the ventricles. So that is the first criterion. The second is a normal PR interval. So the amount of time it takes to transmit from P to the, um, the AV node is of a normal interval for that child, for the age of that child. The third is a normal P wave axis. Now, what the axis of a P wave means, we're very typical, uh, when we talk about axis usually in the heart, we're talking about the um, axis of the QRS complex. Um, and I, until I'd done some cardiology, didn't really think about the axis of a P wave, but really what it means is whether it's pointing upwards or downwards in the correct leads. And in leads two, three, and AVF, the P wave should be upright. And what that tells you is that it is normally sighted within the right atrium. So where the sinus node is, where this P wave is being created, is in the correct place. So it is coming across on the ECG, in the right axis, therefore upwards, okay? So that needs to be normal for it to be a sinus node in the correct position in the heart. Then we move on to something that is sound similar, but is discreetly different, which is that the P wave morphology is normal. 
and that morphology is different to axis um, in that it's the shape of the P wave, so how the P wave is created. The P wave should like, look like a fairly um, uh, symmetrical hill. Um, uh, it should not be very, very pointy, and it should not be like an M. It should not be bifid. Um, and the, the morphology um, is the way in which the uh, electrical impulse is transmitted from atria to atria. So from the right atria where it's being created across to the left atria. Um, if that is not being transmitted in a normal time frame or with a normal amount of electricity, so it's creating too big a current or it is taking too long, the morphology of the P wave, how it looks, will look different. So there is discreetly different from axis, which is whether it's up or down. So that also needs to be normal. So these P wave things, they're all relating to sinus. And the last one is that it's a normal rate for age. If all of the top four criteria are, um, are correct, so you have all the four and you can tick them all off, but the rate is wrong, then all you then have is either sinus bradycardia or sinus tachycardia. Okay, so that is how you create these uh, statements about an ECG and you know that it's correct. So then you can know within yourself it's correct. So let's think about this. Do we think that this looks like normal sinus rhythm? I only need maybe a handful of you to, to be brave and unmute your microphones or put it in the chat. Do we think yes or no for normal sinus rhythm? Yes. We think yes. Have we got any people logged in as a group? Have we got any people logged in at, at work as a teaching? Where there's three or four of you in a room, socially distanced, of course. Yep, we've got some yeses in the chats. Everyone's saying yes, and somebody's correctly said we need the age. Absolutely, right? So we need the age because the age is what's going to tell us whether this rate is normal, but everything else is correct. So let's look at this. Um, across this rhythm strip, you have P wave before every QRS complex, okay? P, 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 okay? Um, and then if you look at the um, the, if you just look on the bottom rhythm strip again, uh, then you can see that the P wave is consistent across the whole of lead to the bottom rhythm strip. So it is of a consistent morphology, which looks right for a P wave. It's not very, very peaked and it's not bifid. And then if you look at leads two, three and AVF, it's upright. So the P wave axis is correct. And um, so, yes, the only thing you would need to know is where uh, what the age of the child was to know whether this rate was appropriate for age. So whoever wrote that, very good. That's the last thing that you would have used. Yes. What about this ECP that I superimposed? Do we think yes or no? So we've got some... No. Can anyone no? So somebody said yes, somebody, a few others, no. Great, okay. Okay, so now people are this with an explanation. So P wave axis is not normal. Does anyone know what that means? So the P wave axis, what I've described before, is that the P waves are not upright. So they are the wrong way around. Leads two, leads, uh, leads two three, and, and in leads three. For this chart. Everything else about it is correct, okay? So P wave does receive a big depending on the age, is um, fine. PR interval, short, you'd have to calculate it. It's actually fine. Right? And that's a very uh, poorly scanned ECG, so you can't see the, the boxes. But good point, we need to know the PR interval. Um, and the shape of the P waves, although they're upside down, the morphology is correct. Yeah. So it's only that one thing. Could incorrect. Uh, yeah, we'll come on to the branch block. Until nine o'clock. Bye. Okay, so what this means, well, the axis of this is wrong. So people have correctly talked about the P wave axis, so it's downwards in lead two, three, and AVF. That means that where this beat is being cre created is not in the normal part of the right atrium. So for, for whatever reason, the sinus node, the node that is creating the first electrical impulse is, um, 
not in its not in a normally cited place. Could be a lead a lead thing, but it's unlikely if it's across all of these leads. And um, so we check the leads, check the equipment, but then uh, you are looking at someone where the sinus node is not in quite the right part of the heart. Okay, so. That is something that in isolation doesn't cause children a lot of problems, but I've put it in there purely to illustrate um, how you meet the criteria for normal sinus rhythm. So that in isolation is not a big problem, um, although probably most people would want to discuss that with cardiology, particularly if this child had come with um, cardiac symptoms. However, uh, if I, if I mute, mute my mic, you're not going to be able to hear me. <laughs> um, but yes, I agree. If there's lots of noise for everyone else in the background, if people mute their mics until they're chatting, that would be great. Um, so basically, the point is that this is called low atrial rhythm. So the only part of the CCG that's wrong is the morphology, the axis of the P wave. Um, and that means that the site of the sinus node is in a different part of the right atrium than we would expect. OK, so let's move on. to access. People should now be able to see a picture of the heart. Um, access, um, I've done a bit of work on ECGs and ECG interpretation in across all uh, the grades of paediatrician from ST1 uh, foundation doctors, in fact, up to uh, consultants. And access is one of the things that's most that's seen as being the most confusing thing. So what I want to explain to you today is what access means. Um, and what it means for the child and then I have a run through on how to calculate it because it's probably one of the, the things that I see going wrong most commonly um, in, in ECG interpretation, if indeed it's done. Quite often people don't do it, so don't calculate the axis at all. So what axis really means is it's a, an, a representation of where the majority of the electrical impulses in the heart are pointing to. So Electrical impulses in the heart are being created by every indiv individual cardiac myocyte all the time by um, transmission of ions across the cell membrane. Um, that's how they're created. And these are flying off in all different directions. However, the majority of these impulses will follow a similar path when there is a big muscle bulk in some area. And for the majority of children over the age of five, that will be uh, the left ventricle. So that's where most of the muscle is as you get older. And certainly when you reach adolescence and adulthood, that is where it should be. So that's what the axis represents, the overall um, flow of electrical current in the heart, the overall direction of electrical current. And that's usually where it points to, down that red line, which is the left ventricle. So now what we're going to look at is how you calculate axis. Um, and let me move on from that. And it's, you, it's done by vector addition. So lots of people will um, associate axis in a pediatric ECG or in an ECG at all with this diagram of a little person with, usually their hands are in the air actually, um, but with their hands in the air with these lines all over it. And this is a diagram that's quite easy to find by typing into Google uh, cardiac axis diagram. And you can find this diagram. But what you are doing is looking at where um, you are where you're plotting your you're plotting electrical activity along these lines to get your overall um, axis of the heart axis of the ventricular depolarization so that's why you use the QRS axis and to do that we have to choose leads that are perpendicular electrically perpendicular to each other and the easiest two leads to choose are lead one which you can see pointing across your screens towards this person's left arm at the zero degrees line. So that's lead one and lead AVF. They are perpendicular to each other. And AVF is positive in the downward direction because that is where you put the lead um, on the foot. AVF is the foot lead. OK, so that's down. And um, so when you're plotting it, you have to remember that because if you plot a positive um, you need to plot, plot the positive defle deflection downwards rather than upwards, which would might, might seem more intuitive. So if you look at these two little diagrams on the right of your screen, you can see that I've pulled out from an ECG lead one and AVF. And their lead one, if you count, is uh, six squares positive. What I'm doing is counting the little squares above the isoelectric line, which runs from uh, the PR across to the ST segment and taking away any downward deflection. And I get six um, uh, slides. Uh, I get six squares. I, I'm getting something through the chat saying people can't see the slides. I can still see my screen share. Can other people see this diagram? Yes. Yeah, yes. 
okay, okay. Um, so for the person that can't see, I'm not sure whether that's something to do with the way that you've set up your go-to meet, um, that you can't see the box, because I think everyone else can see it. Okay, so I'll keep going. So we've got six squares positive, uh, overall positive deflection in lead one. You then need to look at the lead AVF, and the same thing applies. You count the small boxes upwards and take away any negative deflection. And there you get 12 squares positive, because there's basically hardly any negative deflection there. So it's 12 squares positive. Um, once you have reached uh, your decision about how many positive or negative small squares there are, we've got an overall positive deflection in both. So we are going to be plotting our lines in the positive direction along both of these uh, lines. So first of all, you would plot an arrow that is six squares positive along lead one. Now, however long that arrow is, it doesn't really matter, as long as proportionally the next arrow that you plot is proportionally larger okay so the next arrow needs to be 12 squares which has got to be double however long you've made six squares it wouldn't matter whether you made it tiny um, or huge as long as proportionally these two arrows are the same so then you are going to join in the positive direction of AVF join an arrow pointing downwards to the end of your other arrow okay so that is vector addition so you've now plotted an arrow that's double the length at uh, down positive on AVF and what you the the third arrow that you're going to now plot is going to be your overall axis which joins the end of one to the point of the other and there then when you measure the number of degrees from the zero line to where that big arrow is that is where you are going to find your cardiac axis your qrs axis and here it is 60 degrees which is normal um, for a pediatric ecg okay so I hope that's quite clear explanation of axis. I know I've got quite a variety of grades in the audience, and so some of you may already know this, but um, I think it's important to go over the basics so that people can build on it. So then we can look at where the, QR, the QRS axis is. This is just a simplified um, version of the diagram on the page before, where you see the zero line again, um, and you're plotting everything positive, so zero down to plus 90. If you lie between the zero and the positive 90, the chances are your axis is going to be normal unless you're an incredibly young child in the unit, basically. If you are above the zero line towards the vertical line upwards, that's left axis deviation. And if you are beyond the 90 degree line, that is right axis deviation. And you can see them marked there. There's only one scenario in, um, in pediatric ECGs where significant right axis deviation is normal, and that's in a neonatal ECG. So when you're first born, um, your right ventricle in muscle mass is very similar to your left ventricle, and that creates a picture of right axis deviation on your ECG that gradually changes over the course of the first six months. Um, so as a neonate, this would be a normal axis. In fact, even up to 180 can be considered normal for a neonate, and gradually what will happen over the course of your first year is that your axis will change towards looking like this. And I've plotted it slightly behind the zero line because in adolescence, some, some uh, athletic post-pubertal ad adolescents will have slight left axis deviation, which is normal. But the majority of our pediatric population um, will have an axis that is between zero and 90 degrees. And when you come up here, that is a superior axis, okay? That is typically seen in neonates in these conditions so in avsd tricuspid atresia something which will um complicate the way in which electrical impulses are passed around your heart and um, so it means that they are your overall electrical deflection doesn't appear um normal doesn't appear in the, in the correct way um, and so those are the, the the commonly common ones that get asked about in exams so um the p wave I, I realize there's a couple of questions coming up, one question coming up in the chat, and I will go over things at the end, um, any any questions. And if there's loads and loads of questions about the same thing, I'll, I'll stop, is that okay? Um, the P wave is the next thing you're gonna look at. So you've done rate, you've done rhythm, and you've done axis. We've, we've figured out those three things. The next, P, the next thing is the P wave, look at the P wave. And the P wave is atrial depolarization. So it's created in the sinus node. And as I've alluded to before, you can see at the bottom, underneath the normal looking P wave, um, you can see what a P waves look like when they're not normal. So morphology changes. And when you are in the right side of your heart, 
and you have a lot of electrical activity on the right side of your heart, that is plotted upwards on the ECG. So you get a large spike of a P wave, so much bigger than five millimeters or five small boxes. And that is called P pulmonale and would suggest a lot of activity on the right atrial side, which is right atrial enlargement. When you look at the second diagram, where the P wave looks a bit more like an M or a bifid shape, um, that suggests that the time taken for the electrical impulse to pass from the right to the left is longer. And therefore, what you see is the depolarization of the right atrium and the left atrium separating. So you get this M shape. And that is because the left atrium has become larger than it should be for whatever reason. Um, and that means that they, because it's bigger, it takes longer for the electrical activity to travel across. And therefore, you can separate those two depolarizations and you see them on the ECG. Um, so that's called P mitrali. And they're the two typical morphologies of the P wave that you would find um, when you are uh, as, as abnormal morphologies. Which brings us on to the QRS complex, which represents uh, the ventricular depolarization or the true beat of the heart, I suppose. So when the ventricle is uh, pumping. And the Q is the first downward deflection, the R the first upwards, and then the S, the one following the, the downward. And there is re uh, there are uh, different intervals which are normal for different ages. And in general, on an ECG in pediatrics, the intervals will get slightly longer as you um, as you get older in general, not in all cases. But these intervals are some are not things that you desperately need to remember because there are rate, um, there are interval tables um, on, that you can find. Um, and you can find them on in the major cardiology textbooks. You can find them on, don't forget the bubbles, uh, have a great um, uh, table of all the normal intervals. And um, so it's not something you need to particularly remember. If the complex looks abnormal or it looks particularly wide, as usually with the QRS, then I would look it up. So here, well, let's look at these QRS complexes. What, what does anyone want to type into the chat what you think about these QRS complexes? Yep. Yep. OK. Good. OK, so we all know that these aren't looking normal. And the reason they don't look normal is because they're white. Right. And someone's written right bundle branch block. What about this? Is the next one it's just coming to. There's a yeah, that one. Yeah. OK, so we had right bundle branch block in the first one, and now we're looking at left bundle branch block. What about this? OK. Yeah. So we've got a few answers coming through. Some people think it's a bit fast. I suppose that depends a lot on the age of the patient. Um, and other people are putting partial right bundle branch block. Right. So the difference between this and the ones before is that the QRS complex is not broad. OK, so you are getting what we see, what we call partial. And yet it's of a right bundle branch block pattern. But it can't be right bundle branch block unless the br the bundle branch, so where the electrical activity is being transmitted, is completely blocked. And that would create a broad QRS complex. And that's not what we are seeing here. So it's only partially blocked. So partial right bundle branch block is correct. Um, or you can uh, or you can call it intraventricular conduction delay um, is, is another way of, uh, of describing it. A partial intraventricular conduction delay. Um, basically, this can be a normal finding on, or this is a normal finding on lots of um, pediatric ECGs. So someone's talking about, uh, I, I will stop here because someone's asking me about how to interpret bundle branch block. Okay, so um, I'll go back to the first one, um, which was the right bundle branch block pattern. Um, and bundle branch block is um, when the electrical activity is passed from the sinus node through to the uh, 
atrioventricular node, but then the bundle is the bundle of His, and the branches of the bundle of His is what follows the atrioventricular node, and that is what leads the electrical uh, conduction through the heart down into the uh, around the, around the ventricle in both the right and the, the left and the right branches. When one of those branches, for some reason, becomes blocked or the conduction cannot go down that pathway, the conduction has to go down the, it's forced down the other, it's like plumbing, it is forced down the other pathway. And that means the heart has to become depolarized, so the ventricle has to contract by only conducting electri electricity from the uh, AV node down one side of the branch. And that means the electric electricity has to go down the other branch and all the way around the ventricle to then allow the ventricular contraction. And that is why it takes longer. So for a full bundle branch block, whether it is left or right, it has to, uh, because the electrical impulse is being transmitted only by one side and then around the bottom of the ventricle to allow the depolarization, that means that it has to take longer. And therefore, your QRS complex has to be broadened because time is plotted um, uh, horizontally along an ECG. So it has to be broad for it to be full bundle branch block. How you then decide whether it is left or right, the most typical uh, way of doing it is uh, people are talking about RSR or SRS patterns. Uh, the easiest way to remember how to do it is uh, Marrow and William, William and Marrow. Um, and that is where in V1 uh, you see a slight M pattern and in V6 uh, you see a W pattern is Marrow. So the R in the middle of Marrow would, suggest, would mean right bundle branch block. And the William pattern is this one where you again are seeing the broadened complex, meaning that the time taken to get around uh, depolarizing the heart, it's not that it's impossible because the uh, an electrical pathway is working, but it takes longer. So you broaden the QRS complex. Uh, you're seeing here in V1, you get the W pattern and in V6, you get the M pattern, which is William. And the L in the middle of William helps you remember that that is a left bundle branch pattern, okay? So if you see a broadened QRS with these, um, uh, William or Marrow patterns, that is how you will interpret it as um, bundle branch block. And I hope that explains the some of the physio, the basic physiology of why that happens. So that's about time taken for the electrical impulse. So time is along the horizontal axis of an ECG. Now let's talk about hypertrophy. So these are bigger muscle bulks. And these are the criteria for right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, I should, so, so you don't have to remember these is what I was going to say, but if you look at where they are, um, the, is, is in AVR, which is the lead on the right hand. Um, in V1, you get tall uh, R waves and T waves. And in the leads round on the left side of the heart, so if you look at the chest where the V5 and V6 are going to be positioned, which is round at the left, you get very, very deep reciprocal waves. So let's have a look at how that looks on an ECG. This is right ventricular hypertrophy. So if you look at where the chest leads are, so here they're called C1 to C6, um, they are very big on the right side of the heart. So AVR, C1, C2, they're very big complexes. If you contrast that to left ventricular hypertrophy, again, there are criteria which you can look up. You don't really have to remember all of these millimeters, but what you're essentially seeing is that the amount of electrical activity, so the volume, the voltage, which is plotted upwards uh, vertically on an ECG, is large around where the leads are on the left side of the heart. So it would look like this. Now, I realize that this particular ECG that I'm flicking to, um, the uh, this wasn't actually the scan, this was uh, how it was printed out, um, but where you see the C4 and C5, these are overlapping complexes. So as you are putting these stickers on a child's chest around the uh, apex and into the left side of the heart. These are very big electrical complexes. And so if you if I can get you to to visualize where the where the stickers would be on the chest and how that corresponds to big electrical activity, you can understand how that represents a picture of the left side of the heart. So that's left ventricular hypertrophy. That brings us on to the T wave. So we've talked about the QRS complex both in time and in voltage. Um, so then we look at the T wave and the T wave is the last bit of the waveform, which is ventricular repolarization. So this is the ventricle uh, coming back to normal, resetting itself. 
um, and it will tell you, the T wave tells you, can tell you quite a lot of things. It's typically what we look at for um, children who come in with syncope for long QT um, because it's, uh, it takes a long time for the ventricle to repolarize. But it will also tell you sometimes about ventricular hypertrophy because when the uh, ventricle is big, um, the way in which it repolarizes becomes a bit more disorganized and that shows itself in the T wave. So it's not as organized as this T wave looks. So. So let's have a look at T waves. T waves change over the course of your life. Um, and when you are, um, so which is one of the other things that people don't like about pediatric ECGs, they change. So it's not like you can remember, you can learn it once and, and never apply different age groups, but um, that's part of the fun of pediatrics. It's also part of the challenge, I guess. And in pediatric ECGs, it's often something people state to me as a challenge is that they don't know how to um, interpret things at different ages and that can be difficult. So here we're looking at T waves and we will get on to looking at ECGs in their entirety. Um, this is a T waves at uh, three months of life. So this is a child we saw in clinic with T waves at three months of life. After the first week of life, the T waves from V1 to V3 will invert. In fact, they do it very quickly, probably within the first 24 hours. And that happens normally. This is part of a normal physiological process. Then over the course of your life, childhood life, they will start to flip back upwards. Um, and they do this in reverse order. So at, as a baby, you will have inverted T waves in V1 to V3, which is not how they appear in adult ECGs. Between the age of about two and five, and it is very, very variable when this starts, um, they will start to re-invert. So here you can see what I've circled in blue is this is a seven-year-old child, so a bit older, um, but they are starting in V3 to look like they have got um, a bifid almost, or, or a um, up and down T wave. This is the process of it reinverting, starting, but you can see that V1 and V2 are still definitely downwards T waves. If you take this child at the age of 10, you've now got an upright T wave in V3, um, and the one in V2 is pretty much upright with a tiny notch in it, and V1 is still downwards. This shows a normal pattern of um, reinversion of the T waves over the course of that child's, uh, that, of, of, over the course of that childhood. Um, there will be, if you uh, look in the textbooks, there are age criteria and there are standardized age criteria for when it is most normal for that to occur. But the, the bottom line is what matters most is it happens in the correct order. If I started seeing a child where the T waves were at, at one or two, for example, the T waves were still downwards in V3 and V1, but not in V2, that would suggest something was happening which is disorganized or that your, your, um, your equipment was wrong, your leads were in the wrong places. So always check the equipment. Um, so what you need to know is it's happening in the correct order. Now, if you take this child, this one, this is the same child seen through clinic, um, was then lost a follow up and came back at about 15. And now what do we see? What do people think about this? The T waves in this, this is a 15 year old child. Specifically the T waves. Yeah, I think people seem to be getting the feel that this is not normal and it certainly doesn't look normal. And that's a valuable insight when you don't think something looks normal. What I'm trying to teach you is how to describe what you are seeing, describe what is not normal. And yes, abnormal T waves is absolutely right. Um, they are inverted, um, which is not normal at the age of 15 and is definitely not normal in V5 and V4, V5 and V6 at any age, really. Um, so having had the ECGs we've just seen and this starting to happen normally, something has happened here. Something has gone wrong um, uh, with the electrical repolarization of this child's heart. The other thing you can see, which I know I didn't ask you to look at, is that in the, uh, the leads uh, on the lateral chest, so V4, V5 and V6, these complexes are all overlapping again. So this suggests that they, there's a big amount of electrical current, big voltage in that side of the heart, and the, the way in which the heart is repolarizing is not organized, not organized in a way you'd expect for a 15 year old. So what you're seeing here is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These are ECG changes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, and that's what this boy had. Uh, so now we're going to put, take a quick look at intervals. The PR interval is something you may well have looked at during the first uh, uh, scan of the ECG uh, it's whether it's long or short is important and that helps guide you as to whether there is a, um, a block 
and then the QT interval. These are the sort of two most important intervals to calculate on a uh, um, and on an ECG. Um, and the QT interval is calculated by Bassett's formula, which is QT divided by the square root of the preceding RR complex. Typically, it's calculated in V5. Um, I know what the uh, what paediatric ECGs can look like, don't worry, I've seen them all. Um, and sometimes the baseline is very shaky, it can be very difficult to figure out where it ends. So uh, if you cannot get a better quality ECG and you really can't see it in V5, lead two or somewhere else will do. Um, but V5 is, is where we typically calculate it. Um, and various things can prolong your QT interval. Everyone talks about long QT, but there are other things. Uh, changes in your electrolytes, uh, certain drugs will do it. Um, and then there's congenital long QT syndrome. I just want to take a, a, a tiny second here to say that congenital long QT syndrome is something that you are genetically born with. Um, and the phenotype, where the phenotype emerges for you is variable. Um, so in different ages of childhood, you, you, it might become apparent or it might not. Some children, uh, some adults are not diagnosed. Um, the, the thought is that it's around a one in five to 10,000 diagnosis. So one, around one in five or 10,000, some, somewhere in that region um, of people have it. And in those people, they have a genetic predisposition to prolongation of the QT, which means when you then give them drugs which will prolong the QT interval anyway, they will have a bigger reaction to that drug. You can give me enough domperidone, um, and, and I don't believe I have congenital long QT syndrome, although I could be in the dark, uh, but I don't think I do. Um, if you gave me enough domperidone, my QT interval will lengthen, if you gave me enough. And that amount will be different for me, will be different for everyone on this call. But it will that drug and various different electrolyte changes in the right proportion for that individual will prolong the QT. That does not mean those people have congenital long QT syndrome. However, if someone does have congenital long QT syndrome, it will take proportionally less of that medication. And also the results, uh, the chance of them going into a cardiac arrhythmia is greater. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Drugs um, that prolong the QT will do that for almost everyone in the right quantity, um, but you can, as in addition to that, or uh, in spite of that, have also got congenital long QT syndrome, which is a genetic uh, diagnosis. Um, and then there's the ST segment, and we're really looking at whether it's going up, um, uh, so if it's lo looking like it's uh, elevated in the context of a myocardial infarction, which is rare in children, but are not um, unheard of, pericarditis, Brugada is, again, um, not something we typically see in children, but there are a small subgroup um, and early repolarization and down if there are ischemic changes or repolarization. So I did not do this quiz before. I'm not going to do it again uh, because I didn't think we had time and I'm, I'm right. So, so that is great. Um, and I hope that is great. I hope it is great and that I've addressed most questions going along. Um, but what we really need to be able to do is put it into practice. And I think we'll spend the last 15 minutes doing that. So where are we going to continue? Where are we going to be doing ECGs? And I think there's three major areas in emergency where you would consider doing an ECG. And the first I would say is palpitations. Is it pretty obvious reason for an ECG? Children coming in with palpitations, they all get ECGs. What's the majority of children, I'd say in my experience, over 90%, when you do an ECG in a child with palpitations, what is the ECG that you get 90 plus percent of the time, more probably? What do we think? Are you going to see an arrhythmia? Sinus tachy, yeah, possibly. I would, I would agree that uh, for the, I would agree that it's either sinus tachy because they're stressed, or for the majority of the time it's normal sinus rhythm. And everyone breathes a sigh of relief, right? It's normal sinus rhythm. So why are we doing it? If it's going to be normal sinus rhythm, what are we doing it for? So you've done after the episode, what are we really hoping to find here? Um, and that's what's important. So if we, we know what we are looking for, sure, if there's an arrhythmia, you know, they'll be in recess, the bells are dinging and cardiology are on the phone or you've got your consultant in. But actually, if, if 90 plus percent of these are in normal sinus rhythm, let's talk about the ones that are in normal sinus rhythm. Where can we pull out the ones where these palpitations were really a cardiac arrhythmia? So what you're looking for is this. You're looking for, does this child have, yeah, so somebody's just written Wolf Parkinson White, right, a predisposition to SVT, which is what Wolf Parkinson White is. Um, so these children will be back in normal sinus rhythm. 
but do they have a delta wave? That is between the PR and the QRS complex, an upstroke, so a slurred upstroke with a, in combination with a short PR interval. Um, that would predispose them to having an SVT. If you see that on a child who has said they've got butterflies in their chest or the mum thought their heart was fast, they probably were in some sort of supraventricular tachycardia, or at least they are at high risk of having been. They are the children you want to find. Um, if they have got an underlying cause for a ventricular arrhythmia, so people are somebody's written about an abnormal QT, right? If you have got congenital long QT syndrome, you can have short-lived ventricular arrhythmias that you may or may not feel, but if you come in with palpitations, you may have felt. And if you find on the resting ECG that either the QTC is long or the T wave morphology does not look normal, there's something disorganized about how that heart is repolarizing. That subgroup of children, I'm not saying they had one, but are at a higher risk of having had, when they felt their palpitations, an arrhythmia in the ventricle. Um, and that's something that's important to find because most of these ECGs are normal sinus rhythm. The ones that are in an arrhythmia um, when you see them, they're the ones that you're going to be chatting to cardiology or you're going to try and give them adenosine if it's an SVT. The ones that are not, that are back in normal sinus rhythm, we need to have a serious think about um, their risk of having had a cardiac arrhythmia and find those children. So here's one with a two-year-old with a racing heart. What do we think about this? Is this an SVT? Yes, yeah, some of them do look short, don't they? A short PR someone's writing. So let's look at this. We are trying to decide whether this is a sinus tachycardia versus a sinus arrhythmia. And to do that, you look at all the criteria for normal sinus rhythm. Um, and if, it's, if they meet all of those criteria, apart from the rate, then they are sinus tachycardia. And then you look at non-cardiac uh, reasons for um, then you look at non-cardiac reasons for why they would be in a tachy, why they would be having a sinus tachycardia. Um, here, I've circled down there what people are talking about is something's going on with these P waves. So the P waves are different. So this is some sort of atrial arrhythmia. Something is happening with these P waves that is wrong. So this child did have something going on. Yeah. And here we've got a different two-year-old with a racing heart. This is your one that you would either you'd end up in recess or some sort of high dependency with. What's this? Yeah, right. SVT, SVT, SVT. So supraventricular tachycardia. Absolutely. This is what people mean when they say supraventricular tachycardia. But both of those ECGs were actually a tachycardia originating from above the ventricle. So a supraventricular tachycardia. What you are seeing is more of a typical um, looking SVT, which is where the P waves are not clear. The rhythm is very regular. And this is typically either uh, a, a AV nodal tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia. So this is what you treat very easily or, or you generally quite easily with adenosine. Um, so that is typical. So you are seeing this arrhythmia. In the one before was also just a different type of supraventricular tachycardia. Okay. Um, what about this one? This is another palpitations person, an 11 year old boy. He's getting a year of intermittent chest pains and palpitations and some dizziness. Is this an SVT? Right, okay, so probably this was an SVT. Probably this has been um, a child in and out of short runs of SVT or SVT that he's managing to correct himself. So you can ask questions about that. Um, yes, you can see a delta wave on this ECG. Um, so the PR, if you look in V2 and V3 is probably where it's most obvious, but probably also in the uh, the chest leads, the lead one is where you can see this slurring of the stroke between the P wave and the QRS complex in association with a short PR interval. And that is WPW. Yeah. So this child um, has got a visible pathway, which is why you get the slurred upstroke, upstroke accessory pathway causing him to uh, be at risk of going in and out of SVT. And that's something the cardiologist can do something about. OK, so the next reason that we are going to do an ECG in uh, an emergency is syncope. Or do are we? Are we? Do we do? What's the what's the feeling? Does everyone do emergent uh, ECGs when children faint? Just type a yes or a no. Yes, we've got some yeses. 
Good answer in an ECG presentation. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. <laughs> so we're doing ECGs in syncope. Around 15% of adolescents will have a syncopal episode and the vast majority of them will have either a vas vas vasovagal syncope or an orthostatic hypertension. So their blood pressure does not keep up with them standing um, and that is why they hit the deck. Um, so the majority of them are non-cardiac. However, um, the recommendations from the big uh, cardiology uh, guideline committees, so the Amer American College of Cardiologists and the um, European Society of Cardiology, their task force, is that 100% of children with syncope should have an ECG in emergency at the time of the episode. Um, and, and, and that is their guidelines because in the children where there is a cardiac problem, there is a chance that you're going to pick that. Um, and what you're looking for um, is uh, you're proactively looking for high risk features and you're proactively looking for high risk features that this syncope was a short lived cardiac arrhythmia which compromised the perfusion of their brain. And so in some ways you're looking for similar, because if these children are back to being awake, they're not still in an arrhythmia. So you're looking at similar areas in the ECG as you were with the palpitations once that have returned to normal sinus rhythm. Have they got a delta wave? Could they be going in and out of SVT but are feeling dizzy or syncopal with that? Have they got um, changes in their T wave? Have they got uh, very large complexes, Could uh, QRS complexes? Could they have a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the um, in the teenagers specifically, but also younger children can have that. Um, do they have a prolonged QT interval? Do they have T waves that don't look normal so that it looks like the way in which their heart is repolarizing is disorganized? That puts you at increased risk of having an arrhythmia if your electrical impulses are not organized. So look for these things proactively. Um, that's why we are doing uh, ECGs in syncope. And actually some of the um, uh, yeah, I'll answer that question. Hang on. Some of the uh, some of the guidelines on this from the American College of Cardiology and actually specifically the ESC one, which I was looking at the other day, um, have got quite a nice way of um, stratifying children, both by ECG findings, by um, history and by family history into whether they are high or low risk for having a um, um, a cardiac diagnosis for their syncope. Um, so they've got a similar thing that, to, to what we all recognize in our uh, nice febrile children guidelines. They've got a kind of traffic light system. Um, so if you fall into lots of red uh, boxes, you are quite likely to have a um, cardiac cause for your syncope. Um, so it's quite interesting to have a look at. But uh, some of those things are ECG changes. So if you start having ECG changes with syncope, um, and that is one of the things that will make you high risk for having had a heart cardiac arrhythmia. So regarding syncope, I've got a question here which is very topical um, on this slide. Uh, would this include children with clear breath holding history? Right, so um, in children that are younger and clearly have a, a breath holding history with a completely normal cardiac examination, if you look through the guidelines, um, what they would say is that there's a clear alternative cause for their syncope and therefore an ECG would not be mandatory. Um, the, the problem is, uh, that uh, when we say clear, uh, that, um, I have, uh, so let me put this into context with children that I've seen. I have seen children where they have clearly, and people will say clearly, had seizures, for example, or they have clearly had, um, they've been standing, or they've clearly been at the end of a run, um, and that seems like a clear reason for syncope, but actually, and they've not had ECGs. And actually, when you do an ECG, they have changes. So um, it is not mandatory when you are clear on your alternative diagnosis. However, my, my counter argument would be um, in a child that uh, is is young, how clear is the history really going to be? And how how sure are we when, when you can hit the deck and have a few convulsive movements? It looks very much like a seizure. Um, so I would, uh, is my feeling, I would do ECGs, uh, but then I like looking at them and I like using them as a way of teaching. And the risk, the flip side of that is that there is a risk of some children being over investigated um, and that does cause anxiety for the parents. Uh, but yes, I would do it, uh, but it's not mandatory if you are absolutely certain on your history. Um, and then this is the other syncopal one. So this is one I saw actually with absent seizures. What do we think of this? So this boy had been having absent seizures at school. He'd been put on Valparaiso, I believe, um, and had been sort of just zoning out with the teacher and flopping backwards on his chair. Everyone was quite happy that that must be what it was. Someone's written long QT with a question mark. 
Yeah. Great. Okay. So, so this is sort of what I mean. Even where the diagnosis seems very clear from the history that's being presented to you, without an ECG, you're not going to see this. And what you are seeing in this ECG is um, uh, quite broad base to this T wave, so not like quite normal looking. In V4, you can see a little notch in it. Um, and actually, if you calculate this QTC, it's around uh, 490, which is long. Um, so secretary to the anti epileptic medication, yeah, which was started, uh, yeah, so possible, I mean, possibly, I can't remember off the top of my head what anti epileptic medications prolong the QT, um, but also the morphology of this T wave is quite abnormal too. Um, so the point I suppose I'm making with this ECG is without, uh, um, without an ECG, uh, these children are going to come with no symptoms to you. Um, and and it sounds very much like, oh, they're zoning out in class, they, they, they sort of, and then they come back to normal. It's very short. Cardiac syn syncope is very short. And it's got short recovery time usually. So um, it could sound exactly like something else. Okay, and the last one, let me get through the last one. I'll ask that, um, I'll answer that last question, chest pain. So chest pain is a contentious subject for general paediatricians, I think, I believe, uh, some doing uh, universally doing ECGs and some not. Um, and I think it's probably the, one of the most common reasons for a cardiac referral into paediatric cardiac clinics. The common reason you are looking for, if you're going to do an ECG in chest pain, again, remind yourself with the history, what are you really looking for here? Um, you're not going to find structural cardiac disease, uh, you're unlikely to, um, although you might find some changes which suggest that, um, but chest pain is usually a symptom described by children over the age of five. Um, and so the reasons they may have chest pain related to their heart is um, pericarditic type changes, um, myopathies, so hypertrophic or uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathies, um, and then sometimes it's associated with their syncope or their arrhythmia. So this, the process of having an arrhythmia can give them cardiac chest pain. Um, and the one last one is anomalous uh, coronaries. So if your coronaries arise from the wrong place, um, you're effectively getting ischemic type chest pain. And what the ACC say in their guidelines, um, they don't make mandatory guidelines on whether we should or should not be doing uh, ECGs on all causes of chest pain. But what they do very strongly advocate is that you take, in an, as open a way as possible, a very thorough history. And if you are getting quite typical sounding cardiac chest pain, possibly with syncope or palpitations, um, without an alternative explanation, um, we should be doing an ECG. If you are clearly getting per, um, pleuritic type pain, which is reproducible, um, then, then that can be left to one side. But I've already, in the cardiac clinic I was in last week, um, three of the children referred were with chest pain. Uh, and, and that was the only reason, hadn't had an ECG prior to their referral. So what do we think about, I mean, I'm running three minutes over, I'll do this as the last case and then answer the questions. This is a 15 year old swimmer with chest pain. What do we think? Okay. Okay, so we're actually getting a few different things. Uh, most people are are uh, are agreeing that there's something about the ventricle going on here. If you look along the rhythm strip on on V two, uh, on lead two, sorry, uh, look along the rhythm strip. What you're seeing along that bottom rhythm strip is you see three three ventricular ectopics. So people have uh, have, have rightly identified that. Um, you probably need a longer rhythm strip to ass assess whether this is uh, is truly by Gemini in that there are two beats and then a, and then a and then an ectopic. But there are certainly ectopics, and you don't you sometimes see um, uh, isolated ectopics on ECGs of all ages, um, and it's not an abnormal finding. But that's quite a few to see on one single ECG. So we'd want to know a bit more about what the history was, of course, whether the chest pain sounded cardiac, and what other symptoms were uh, around around this child. 
And our concerns would be, um, is this chest pain, has it been preceded by a viral illness? Um, have they been getting a little bit worse uh, virally and could this be a myocarditis? So it's unlikely to be, uh, I, I think that the, the pericarditis was mooted some, by someone, that's possible, but I think if you look along the chest leads, there's not universally um, ST elevation in the normal looking um, uh, QRS complexes, I don't think, um, although it's not still not impossible that they could have pericarditis and certainly in lead three in AVF it does look a little bit elevated, but whether that viral history plays into that sort of uh, myocarditis, pericarditis type thing. Um, and then the, the other thing is, are these ventricular ectopics coming? Because this child has got um, a, an electrically excitable ventricle for some underlying reason. And that would be uh, something that predisposes them to ventricular arrhythmias. So you're looking at ventricular ectopy, broad early complexes with no P waves. And what would be useful is to know whether these symptoms, the other thing that would be useful is whether these symptoms are very short or whether he's been having these on and off for his entire life, because that might tell you whether this is an acute illness or something different. Well, what would you let him swim? He wants to swim in an athletics competition. What do we think? Tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> tomorrow. I think when you ask leading questions like that, you're obviously going to get the, the answers you sort of want. Um, but yeah, if you see somebody and you can't get uh, with irrit with ventricular ectopy, um, which is undiagnosed, uh, so we don't know why it's happening, um, where there are uh, associated cardiac symptoms, I think allowing them to raise their heart rate uh, quickly uh, would be uh, not a good idea. And yes, I, I would call cardiology if there was more history about this child um, and, and likely discuss about whether, depending on the history, if this was short and it was a myocarditis, it might be supportive therapy. Um, if this was uh, a long term history and actually we find out that over the last two years he's been having these symptoms and this is the first time he's had an ECG, that might need a slightly deeper cardiac investigation. Um, so. I would agree that I think not doing anything until he's uh, investigated is a good idea. So um, I'm not going to do this one because we are actually running uh, uh, over time and it was only the last one. Um, but what I hope I have achieved is that for anyone that was lacking in confidence or finding that ECGs were complicated, that you have a systematic approach. You have my systematic approach, which is similar to lots of others. Other people, I realize it's not. I've not reinvented the wheel, uh, but to analyzing the ECG and its components, to understanding what they mean. And then to sort of starting to formulate a diagnosis, diagnosis or at least discussion around specific points. So if you can have a discussion around this doesn't look right because of the ventricle, it doesn't look right because of the T wave, then then you can you can get get on with that discussion with either your consultant or with the cardiac team. Um, and if you are clear that this is a normal sinus rhythm ECG without any other high risk factors, you can be confident in doing that. Uh, you can be confident in saying uh, that is the case. And we have focused a bit on the cardiac present presentations to eat uh, emergency. So if you all could please, I know a few people have left already, but there's still 77 of you. If you could please scan this QR code and give me a bit of feedback. Um, this, I generally do this teaching face to face or have done previously and uh, would love some feedback on whether this needs to be modified a bit for the virtual setting, because I think more and more that's how we're going to teach um, or what you felt or if there's anything else um, that you wanted to say to me, I would really value it and be able to make a better presentation, even better presentation next time. So please scan the code, please give me some feedback. And I do remember you, Shuang. Hello, I've still got your thank you card. Um, I do remember you. What do I recommend for you to read about ECGs? Interesting question. Um, I think that the guidelines in the colleges are very good, but I think you already have to have an understanding of what you're looking for to read those guidelines. So the um, the uh, the tell you what findings you're looking for as a high risk category. For actual basic reading on ECGs, so if you want more on what I've just done, um, I would say that life in the fast lane is a good place to go. Um, and uh, the, the other thing I found this morning on Twitter actually was that the, I'll see if I can find it again, was that the East, um, some of the, one of the Midlands deaneries have got uh, cards against pediatric ECGs. So they've created a game. Yeah, here it is, it's on Twitter. So I will share this on my Twitter feed um, and it's quite easy to find if you know how to spell my surname and I'll write it in the chat. Um, if I share it on my Twitter feed, East Midlands uh, Free Online Access Medical Education 
have got a game called Pediatric ECGs. Now, I've not downloaded the whole thing. I only saw it this morning, but it talks about um, having matching up an ECG with a diagnosis and with a potential management plan as a kind of game to do in teaching. Um, and I clicked on a couple of the, of the uh, ECGs and they looked quite good and they're of good, the ones I clicked on were good quality. So I'll share that on my Twitter feed. Um, but I would say life in the fast lane, uh, the basics of, there's lots of basic books on ECG interpretation. The biggest thing I think you can do is where we describe chest pain or syncope, do these ECGs in emergency, uh, do them and look at them and take the time to systematically um, look through them and make comments on everything you think and then discuss it with someone who's got an interest in your department and looking at ECGs with your seniors, with your registrar. Um, and that is how you will get the, uh, the, a good feel for what does and doesn't look normal. Uh, there was a question skipped due to time about pathological Q waves. Okay, so um, Q waves where they exist and they are greater than five millimeters. Um, so the Q wave is the downward deflection after the PR interval, um, where they're greater than five millimeters, and especially if they are um, across all of the chest leads, would be considered pathological. Small Q waves are normal, um, and the reason that people look for them is either if there's been ischemic changes before, uh, so the, the heart has gone through some sort of ischemic change and therefore they're there for that. The other reason that they sometimes appear is when the coronaries are in the wrong place and therefore there's some mild ongoing ischemia to, um, to the bundle and that's why you see a Q wave. So larger than five millimetres of a downward deflection, especially if they are across uh, all of the chest leads, is what I would consider pathological. I hope that that helps that question. Um, I'm going to stop recording now, but I'll wait around. Um, and if there's any other questions, let me know. <laughs>